first of two presentations today, so we've got a couple of our uh, associated projects. Okay. Uh, Jonathan Gutow? Gutow. sorry. Gutow. It's, it's, it's massively manual Russians. <laughs> Uh, it had lots. It had extra before. syllables and yeah. things like that before the round. Like Probably a lot of us were under the impression that, that John is the lead developer on JMOL, but he is actually our, our main contact. So he's the responsive person in the project as far as Sage queries and uh, yeah. helping JMOL work with Sage. So Sorry I'm definitely you. not the lead person. Because Bob Hansen at St. Olaf is the lead person. He does probably somewhere between 85 and 95 percent of the code development for the JMOL project. It's also Iris' dad. Yes, yes it's also <laughs> Iris' dad. His oh. father's carrying a, a lot of weight on this project. And the things that it can do, we can thank him for the majority of it. The only, the other person who contributed a great deal was Miguel Howard, who wrote the original graphics stuff, which does all of the 3D graphics in, co in Java code, so the, in byte code, so you don't, this will run on any machine. You don't need a graphics processor. Uh, which is really neat. So what's been flashing up here is, was basically something, a demo that's a really, a, that I built for the chemists, but I thought it would give you an idea of the kinds of things JMOL can do. It really was you know, originally designed to look at things like this, ball and stick images of molecular structures where the balls represent the atom positions and the sticks sort of represent bonds. Chemical bonds really aren't sticks or springs, but that's sort of how people look at them. Uh, and because the biochemists like to represent things as cartoons, we added these cartoon images were added, which started to mean we could do surfaces and things like that. Molecular orbitals, these represent the locations, the re volumes of space where the electrons actually are in a molecule. And different orbitals have different energies and different distributions. The colors represent the sign of the wave function. It's actually a comp usually a complex function. And what we're plotting is the surface that surrounds the volume where there's a probability of the molecule of the electron being. And that's why the slice through here has a scale on it. And this is just bigger balls. And so some surface, just to give some idea of the actual outer shape of molecules. We do have symmetry operations. They're real important for understanding molecular vibrations. And it, actually can figure out from a molecule what symmetry groups it falls in. And of course, there's just a surface, a function plot. We'll look at that in more detail later. So that give, may give you some kind of an idea of what uh, this, this program can do. And the reason I show that to you is mostly I want to elicit ideas of what should JML be doing in, in SAGE. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to do was tell you about my project this summer that I'm working on for actually coding in JMOL, and I will show you a sort of a very preliminary version of what this can do. So let me open in JMOL. So this is just looks like a sphere, but this is actually one of those atomic, one of those orbitals, and it goes through a whole bunch of sign changes inside. So one of the things that I thought would be interesting for Sage people and is also interesting to chemists is being able to slice through these complex. Is it possible to make that any bigger, or is that just impossible? Oh. Sure. I mean, at this point, it's just, just a no. The, the no, the font. Text. See, like, yeah, it's impossible. Oh, it this just looks text like, looks like Greek. You don't even need to worry about the text. That okay. was for me to uh, to so control and show. And then I don't think at this point that you want it. You really need to see the command stuff. I can actually probably just okay. Um, so anyway, what I'm going to do is 
I've actually already sliced this surface, but the way it was saved, the um, other surface came up as okay. So, actually, I must have opened the wrong file. Yes, I did. Opened the wrong file, sorry. That's not, here we go. Here's the one. So anyway, what I was working on was this. So something that would allow you to say, this is not a good color for this, this is better. Allow you to say, okay, I've got that surface, it's complicated, I want to just take a slice through it. And you know, I got to work on things like how intense the ghost, is, the ghost mesh is and things like that. But all you specify is the angle is a, a point, a vector that points to the plane in the center of the slice and how thick you want the slice and where you want it along that vector. So I tried to make, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible to specify it. And what I'd like to do is build a GUI where you just got sliders. Angle, distance to the slice, and slice thickness. And then you could just sort of drag it around and go and slice through your surface. So it's only applicable for spherical no. like P1 symmetry, right? Like you no, need a plane it's a to well, it's it. a spec. It, it, you could do it to any surface, but specify certain. Basically, specifying the location of the slice is being specified in spherical polar coordinates. I thought would be the easiest. Admit it, mostly because that's sort of your point of view. Yeah. And you know, even if it were a cube off on of the right there, when you got up to it, you'd yeah. slice the cube. But so you specify two vectors to get to, to get where you're. Where well, you're actually, you, you specify a, you specify the spherical you specify a vector in spherical polar coordinates, and I just the direction vector. So all you need is the, the z what the theta and phi. So does the slice always go through the origin then? No. Oh. You could move it off. Um, okay. Let me see. I, I'd have to redo this. Uh, the reason I did this is I, I haven't gotten, I, there's some problems about specifying the viewing region, and if I don't hit 50, if I just did 50% because I knew that would hit the ISO surface. Um, but we'll try to look at, let me bring up, I'll bring up some, uh, a non-spherical surface later. We'll see if I can slice it, okay? It, it's very preliminary at this point. But that's what I'm working on. That's my... JMAL programming project for the summer. And if we get it working, if people are interested, we'll see if we can plug a, uh, a JavaScript interface into it, into uh, Inside Sage. Okay? Uh, something that I thought would be also interesting is just to remind you got folks that you can do things like this. So let me see if I can open the right file here. So again, this probably, I'm opening a molecule file simply because that's the kind of data I have. This is fluorobenzene, probably doesn't mean a great deal to you, but if I bring up, um, actually I don't have to do it here, I'll just do it the menus. Um, I have a little last frame where I have some data. So this actually, Actually, somebody was asking about animation. I don't know if it'll be real obvious with this one, but let me just play the animation here. Let's see if you can see it. I don't know that you'll be able to. No, this is a calculation where it's not changing shape very much. It was almost done. But you can see it jiggle in. So you can do animations. But I'll talk about, I'll, do, I'll show you something else later. I want to do is show you that one of the things you can do is take a surface and map a function onto a surface as a color scale. This is this is what's called the molecular electrostatic potential. So we've taken the basically solvent accessible surface of this molecule and we map uh, red as more negatively charged and, and blue as more positively charged. On this, but you could this can be used this could be used in Sage to map functions on your surface too. We might have to do a little modification, but I think not. I'd have to talk to Bob about that a little. Okay. So something else that So here it's only a surface which is colored, right? Yeah, it's just the surface that's colored. Is so it possible to have a three D region colored? A what? Three D region with a fog? A solid region. Can you have oh, a cloud? Yeah. 
coming. Yes, we tend to, let me see if I'm, I'm not even sure I've got the version that has this working right now. Um, but Iris' father has been working on a, um, what we call a Monte Carlo representation of these solid volumes where it does point density, but I think you can also color the points by function intensity. Uh, I'm n that's not in the release version yet. Okay, and I'm not, you know, it, it, expects, it expects volume data of a certain kind. It's been designed to work with electron density maps. But, yes, there's a possibility. You color mists. <laughs> yes, okay. yes, there is, a, there is a sort of a color miss possibility. But I'm pretty sure what I've got here doesn't have it in it. It's some, he, he's, he's put up with some cartoons to show what it looks like, but I'm not sure. Let me, I can try it. Let's just try something. Uh, it's going to take me too long to remember what the command would be to make it work. But the answer is maybe. And yes, there's definitely something in development that sort of does what you're talking about. Okay, so something else to show you is right now, and you'll see it when I show Sage, um, JMOL inside Sage, we actually go and draw lines to get axes and so on. Built into JMOL is an ability to sort of do this semi-automatically, so let me, um, let me just show you an example where I did this with a, um, a, a, a protein model, and we have a bound box that's automatically defined by it, and you can specify the space the tip that it have ticks and specify the spacing between them. Now one of the problems is that for molecular views we usually default to looking down the z-axis. And that has meant that the default the locations for the tick marks are sort of funny. If you look at the where the y-axis is, that's not usually the way you would do it for a mathematical viewpoint. You'd put the you'd put the tick marks on different edges of the box. So that's something to think about. But if we did it this way, it would be easy within the JavaScript to turn off, on and off the axis box and the labels on the axes. We could easily do communicate with JMOL through JavaScript. Whereas right now, you have to go in and figure out what the what each object is and turn it on and off. And can, you, can you also easily set like the size of the labels? Or um, yeah, there is a way to do it. I don't remember yeah. the syntax for that, but you know, I could do, um, nice. for instance, we could just change the x-axis to, um, let's see, right now I think it's spaced by 10, we could space it by 5. Is there any way you can get those fonts bigger so we can see them, what you're typing? Um, no. Not, that's not going to be easy because okay. that's just a job of it's just a, a Java window. I mean, I could probably do, I could probably zoom the hang in there. Um, control and then slip control. do your fingers up. Yeah, no, no, no. It's okay. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. You can I zoom can in on the video. This is why I didn't write This is why Sage is a notebook. Yeah. yeah. But <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so basically, I just at this point, I'm mostly as I said, the commands are somewhat esoteric. Uh, mostly, what I want to do is give you an idea of some of JMOL's capabilities. What and if we want them in Sage, what I think we do is try to make them available through options, either JavaScript options or change the pop-up menu here. Right, we have control over what peer, appears in that menu. Right now, there's some original changes that were originally put in the first time JMAL was included, and they're really probably not the most appropriate selection anymore. <laughs> How easy is it to rebuild JMOL to have a custom? The menu. Your JMOL jar to have a custom menu. Uh, you don't have to. It's, a, yeah. it's actually a file that JMOL reads, the applet reads on startup. 
Yeah. You just tell it where the file is. We have a custom MNU file that yes. just gives all the options. So it's not a big deal. We just have to decide. You'd have to decide what needs to be in And it. is that how you link to the inform controls for JMOL? Because I've used JMOL a little bit, and I know you can have your JMOL applet window, and then you can have other controls that are just HTML. No, those we use, we just, the HTML controls we use simply JavaScript communication. So what's it talking? What's it called? It's talking, what's it called? Uh, I don't want to say live script. No, that's not right. But it, it's, calling, it's calling JavaScript commands that then pass you know, strings to the applet that have the command information. In the oh, all in browser, browser, all client side. All client side. And we do, you try very hard not to do anything that goes back to the server. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there good documentation on how to set that stuff up? Yes, there is actually quite good documentation on the um, best place to start is at, well, here. This is the documentation for what I'm typing in the command windows. And every command is described with its syntax and so on. Yeah. And the setup stuff is described uh, on the JMOL, oops, I don't have it up, the JMOL wiki. And I'll show you inside Sage, I've actually put in a link to the wiki and the JMOL site at SourceForge that has all the documentation on how to set stuff up. Okay. Did, did you run into troubles where sometimes the JavaScript might like try to communicate with the applet mm -hmm. before it was fully loaded? Ah, yes, that's a big deal inside um, Sage. And it's um, a big deal that I run into a lot too. Yeah. And how, what's your solution? My <laughs> solution has been to, to act to do callbacks from the applet, because the applet, JMOL has callbacks, so I set up a callback function, and I essentially pull the, you're essentially pulling the applet, pulling that, the, some output from that callback function to see when it's been set. Right. To see if the applet's loaded properly. But yes, this was an extremely big deal in getting the interactive controls inside Sage yeah. I, I found the same thing, and since we're loading arbitrary applets in, you know, not all of them have been written properly to communicate back, so we had to have fallback things in addition to that. But that was, if the applet is cooperating, right, then it's not The applet's so cooperating bad. pretty well, and actually, unfortunately, my server's down, so I'm going to do my demo locally. But, well, I was going to do it from a server so that you could see that if you get a delay, that it pops up a window and says Applet X is having trouble loading. We'll try one more time. If it doesn't load, reevaluate the cell. Things like that. Okay. Details will be more about that. But yeah, no, it, it was a re it was it was it, it turned out to be quite painful, and I'm still not sure it works right in Internet Explorer. <laughs> Internet Explorer should be uh, shot and buried in a deep hole. Which version? Any version. <laughs> probably the newest one's probably worse. I haven't gotten it running on any virtual machines yet. <laughs> I haven't got any nice things to say about it. <laughs> I've had a lot Last of David, what his opinion as of what we need. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what? Is there somebody here who likes Internet Explorer? Uh, I, I'd love to hear what I'm doing wrong. <laughs> uh, I, it is the only browser that's given me trials. I was saying that before the talk here, I, usually if I write what I believe is compliant JavaScript, it works in Safari, it works in Firefox, it works in Chrome, and it works in Opera. And then there's Internet Explorer. It doesn't work in Internet Explorer. And so then I tweak it to get it to work in Internet Explorer. Now, part of it is they are more forgiving. Okay, so one of the other things people have asked about is, what about time-varying functions? And I don't have an example where I put up a time varying function, but and unfortunately this is a little small and this page is not set up to, um, let's see if I can, the problem is zooming in on the applet sometimes causes real problems, but let's see if I can make this zoom so it's a little bigger. See if this works. This may fail miserably because we've changed the size of the applet, but JMOL has the capability to store data in multiple frames and then 
try to animate between them. So in theory, if we wanted to do time varying functions, we could load data into multiple frames and then animate it. So I thought I would just show the example, if I can get it to play, of what happens with doing this with a molecule. So we're moving a bunch of spheres around in this case. So this, you just, there's only two frames here? And Jamal's doing all the animation? No, 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 there's okay. lots of frames. <coughs> okay, do you have to send every frame to Jamal, or can it? Yes, you have to, if you want it to, you, you have to. You just do T frames and have it take care of animation? No, it's not, it's not interpolating. Okay. Okay. It's there's just, no interpolation, there's no trajectory interpolation function? No. Can you rotate it? Um, actually, yes, we could. While it's, yes. oh yeah, there you go. While it's moving. Um, yeah, yeah. Should be. Did I stop it? No, it's yeah. it's a lot you, slower. But it, because it's bigger, it's a lot slower. It depends. Yeah. You know, there are some limitations. Now, Can remember in this case what it's doing, it's keeping track of the locations of every single one of those spheres. There's probably about 3,000 atoms in this molecule. So we're actually asking quite a bit of it. But we'd easily have 3,000 points in the 3D surface. Points? Points are different. A surface okay. is going to be handled differently okay. than... Right? Each one of these atoms ends up, we've got an atom location, then we've got to worry about the sphere that represents it. Right, and we've got to do the intersects, we've got to do the Z, we've got to do the Z matrix, um, you know, what's in front of what, as we spin it. So, yeah, that's part of why it's slowing down. Does it use the graphics acceleration? No. no. J this is, and this, and JMO was originally written this way because you couldn't depend on available graphics acceleration on every machine. I think, I have to see if I can talk uh, Iris' father into this, I think we need to at this point look into that because I know that the Java Virtual Machines now have some hooks I believe to OpenGL stuff which will allow you access to, to some of the graphics acceleration if it's available. Uh, and it may be worth implementing that, but I'm that's way out of my league as far as uh, programming ability, but that would make it higher performance. Although this is very good, I mean, it'll, it'll handle 8,000 atom molecules plus an isosurface or two pretty well. Okay, so that was one idea. And then, okay. So here's the uh, the next thing I thought was worth showing you was this. I want to show you a, something people have asked me about is you know suppose I've got something in Sage that I then want to take down and make into a web page. Right now you can't do that, but let me show you sort of where you a way we, we might be able to. Let me show you something we can do easily in the application, and I'll talk about what we have to do to be able to do it in the app. So, one, this one, this is good. so here's something that looks more like a sage plot. I just brought up a you know, modes of a square drum or something like that. Uh, and this time I'm using the bound box rather than the sage hand drawn axes in this case. But in the applet, as you'll see when I show you how to do it, you, you can um, take to the image out of Sage and we'll be able, you'll be able to modify it. The image Sage puts up and you'll be able to modify it a little bit. So for instance, I could I could change this to a mesh representation. Now, suppose you then wanted to use this on a website. What you need to do is get it down to your local machine. So in the menus of JMOL are these file options. Whoops. Uh, come on. And in the file options is save as a JMOL file, a zip file, which contains absolutely everything. It contains the data, all the commands to reproduce exactly the view that's there. If I had it spinning, it would know that it's supposed to be spinning and things like that. 
And the applet that we use in Sage right now is what's called a non-signed applet. It's not, it does not have this save file option. If we were to use the signed applet, that we could have that option in the menu and the user could save whatever they've done inside the Sage interface to their desktop or to their, to their computer. <coughs> and so for instance, let's save this one just call it, uh, I don't know, mesh or something. The point is that you can then open it again. So if I get rid of this, so I have nothing in JMOL, I can go open the file I just saved. To find it. I should have looked to make sure I put it in the right directory. There it is. And we get back exactly what we started with. Same orientation, same options, everything. Everything. Okay? And here's the other thing that the application has. So if you downloaded it, you can load it into the application, and then you can do export to web page. Okay? And right now, then we keep updating this, and this is actually how I got involved in um, JMOL, is it brings up this dialogue, and there's basically two options. One that gives you alternating JMOL applets with regions to put in text, and one that gives you, and I'll actually probably make one of these, a scrolling window where there's text and buttons that changes what view you have in JMOL. So I've only got one view here, but we could say, all right, let's add the present state as a JMOL is, so we'll call this one the mesh view. Okay. And you might notice over here, it may be hard to see, but there's some widgets. So you can have a spin on off button automatically. You could have a change background button, stereo viewing button, uh, animation control if you've got multiple frames in the file, things like that. An open console button, which gets you the command line, those kinds of things. And then we could go back and uh, say we wanted to change this back to Whoops, that's not good. The color's black, right? Yeah, I, tried, I filled it with black. <laughs> that's better. So a blue ice surface, that's still not great. Maybe we should do this. Uh, make it spinning or something. All right, so I could, I could now add add that one. Um, okay, so now we've got two different ones and then you can save it as an HTML file. And what you get, I'll just show you this into the browser and you can open this in a um, in what I normally very open it in composer or one of the WYSIWYG tech um, HTML editors but you get a file that looks like this now I just have to find it there it is you get a directory with that you have to put up on your server but it has an HTML page that that's interesting. Oh, I know why. I don't have a full installation of the, the applet. Normally what this comes up with is it moved, it'll copy the applet into the directory and so on and you get a live applet here. And basically you can see I've got places to put it in your editor, you just put in text and so on. And there should be buttons that appear. And there would be buttons that appear. And switch between the two different. Yeah, they switch between the two different. And does it have fallback for if J to show that graphic? If, if the JML's if the applet's not there, right, you can see the buttons. The, the you the, see a static image. You just see a static image. Now, interestingly, I'm not sure why this one's so bad. It looks like it's a small PNG and then scaled up. Yeah, it was a small PNG that was scaled up. That's probably. This isn't the actual GMO. 
This is in the J Mall. This isn't J Mall because I forgot. I'm, I'm all I have is the development application jar, and you need the full installation of J Mall to get the applet as well. And all I did for this demonstration was get the development application jar to show you. So in that directory you showed us with all the files, so it would have been. That's right. If you had the, if you have a full Java file. Yeah, if you have a let's see if I can find an older one. I think I have an older full JMAL directory. What you get. Um, yeah, so for instance, if you download all of JMAL, you get this a huge directory. Let's see if I can. If you, had you get this huge directory with all the applet jars in them, and if you got that, if you've got the full installation, when you create a web page, it will create, it'll it'll give you the applet you need, and leave that in the directory, for example, or you can install it on your server. There's instructions for doing it either way. Uh, but anyway, so. The, here's the thing people should think about and I want to hear about a little bit is the signed applet, which would allow you to save these .jmol files to your lo a local computer, puts up all kinds of nasty warnings and so on when you launch it. So I'm somewhat disinclined to put it as the default jmol inside Sage, but I think it wouldn't be difficult to have a, like this yeah. applet might, you know, that's right. So you have to allow it to oh, access your, your computer and things like that. Yeah. One option is to have a save to local disk or download to local disk button, which would then swap you over to the signed applet. And then you get all these warnings, but you would have made that decision and it wouldn't be so surprising. So think about that a little bit as far as interface goes. If people think this is, would be that being able to download that would be useful. Would that mean you'd have to download both applets? Like you would say save the file and it would download 1.9 megabytes of the new applet? Yes, you would get okay. the new signed applet, yes. But that would happen once and then from then on it would be cached. Yes. Okay. And that's another reason I wanted to show the servers here. With the JML applet is, the, the JML applet's in chunks as you can see up here. But the first, the first jar that downloads is um, about one to two megabytes. So it does take a few seconds to download it the first time you open it. Now, actually, I think this is smaller than the original version of JML that is in in Sage right now. So it's a little bit faster to download. Okay. Okay, one more thing I want to show you, and then we're going to look, I can, I'll answer questions while my computer reboots and I'll give you a quick view of what the interface in Sage, the newer interface in Sage looks like at this point. So the one more thing I wanted to show you is I stumbled on the following, something called J dot plus. So people have been, uh, you know, we've been talking about Rado's uh, network map program. Somebody has done a little work. Now, it doesn't look like there's a lot of development at this stage going on, but they took a version of JMAL and they, like, this will run, and they've made some sort of a network mapping program out of it. What I'm not sure about is how easy or difficult it is to specify points in it. It basically looks like they took JMAL and they have a lot of the standard JMAL JavaScript coupling code and stuff like that in it. But I guess my comment is I don't know anything about this, but since there is apparently interest, people should probably look at this. So it's JNET plus, J-N-E-T-P-L-U-S. If you're interested in the network mapping and map stuff, you probably should look at this since we've already got JMAL embedded 
in Sage. It, if this is useful, it might not be very hard to embed this as well. It's 3D. It's 3D. Okay. And you know, it has the the same thing. You can draw planes, so you you can group networks and one things in one plane, and other things in another plane. I, um, let's see. There, I think there were. In, let's see if there's one of these in their gallery you know, pictures like that. I screwed that up. So anyway, as I said, somebody somebody who knows something about this needs to look at it and see whether it's worth considering at all. But yeah, it looks what's like their it's, license? Uh, it's based on JMOL. I believe it's okay. got to be GPL. Cool. That looks really cool right there. Okay, but I don't. I have no idea. This is out of my area, but it looks like it might be useful since this is things you've been thinking about. And certainly in the 3D one, although I didn't do it, you can take a node and grab it and move it. I know you can do that. I did try that. So here's what I was talking about, right? Using some of the facilities that JMAL has built in, map up everything on planes. Here they've got some pictures that are using some of the JMAL cartoon, the molecular cartoon stuff. Okay. So it looks like the application version of it has a bunch of useful things. I'm not sure about what happens in the web interface. So something for you guys to look at. And now what I'm going to do is try to reboot into my uh, Linux side where I've got where I got this running where I got Jmol and Sage running in the Flask notebook, and we'll show you. Little start, yes. But anyway, while it's going through a reboot, two things. You all know I'm a chemist, but what you don't know is that I started, uh, my graduate work was mostly laser spectroscopy, measuring, using lasers to run, do chemistry, and learning things about molecules by doing spectroscopy. So I'm very enamored with lasers. Now you saw I brought with me you know, a standard green laser pointer. I've also got this one that looks like a very purple dim laser pointer. Uh, it's about 405 nanometers. It's basically out of the, re it's barely in the region where most people's eyesight works. <laughs> but I always, my, I, we got, I, was, I brought this into class one day and the students were playing with it and somebody went like this. They shined it on a piece of white paper. And look at how bright that is. What that is is that almost everything white you have has what are called brighteners fluorescent molecules in them, and they fluoresce in the blue mostly. Oh, when they absorb, so they absorb this near UV light, this purple light, and then re-emit it as blue light. So you can, you know, like these walls don't have much whitener in them, they look, you see purple. But if you shine it on something white or somebody's clothes, even, you know, my clothes are dark, so, but even, say, right, even my clothes glow because there's whiteners in most laundry detergent. Cool. So, our chemistry demo. Yeah, there's, yeah. My, there's my chemistry demo. Oh, shoot. I didn't, I, I didn't catch yeah. <laughs> talking too much here. All right. I'm not quite blowing anything up. Oh, no. <laughs> we'll start again. Because i got to force it to go into the Linux side. So I think we ought to do a Wednesday night blowing up demonstration. Yeah, we got, we got to get the access to stuff. Here. No, I don't have access to anything here. <laughs> How to destroy things with well, stage. Or as this, as this teacher said yesterday, how to commit felonies in your garage, right? That's right. <laughs> Don't commit, yeah, well, avoid doing Yeah, how, how to, what we do in lab, <clears throat> felony in your garage. Yeah, how to not commit felonies in your garage. Don't do this. <laughs> okay. So I'll take it a minute here to get into the, uh, into my Linux side here. And my computer will probably overheat while doing it, but overheat. I haven't got—I haven't quite got the right—I haven't got the right graphics driver, and so it's not—it's not, it's not um, <coughs> probably back the GPU. Why are you Probably. using Linux for um, this demonstration? Like because what? I was doing my development in Linux because okay. I ha it leaves less um, random files sitting around in the directory structure, so it's much easier for me to upload stuff to people. You don't get the .ds files and stuff oh. like that that Mac OS provides. 
So I have a tendency to do my development stuff on, on Linux. I think there's an option to tar, so when you use tar, it won't grab all those extra files. We had yeah. to add that for Sage when you build binaries there. Uh huh. No. I forgot the option is, though. I always forget. And this machine's old enough that rather than doing it in a virtual machine. Whoops. Mm -hmm. cool. I don't know my own password? <laughs> That's not good. Caps lock. No, it's not on. I just didn't type one character. Sorry, people are watching. Special passwords. Okay, so let's see if I can get this up. And we'll show you that it's working. What, what I've got so far is working in the Flask notebook. And get, hopefully give you ideas. And then I am going to try to call it quits here. Been talking a long time, much too long. Okay. Let's just start up Sage here. So what are you, what did you want to do with the? I'm just noticing that JNet Plus basically seems to render a JML scene, and then all the each individual object is sort of draggable. Yeah, well, each individual object, and in JML. Is there a way to enable that? So, like for a Sage graph graphics in 3D, we can change it so that certain individual objects are draggable. I. Let me have you do. Yes, it. there is within limits. The, that's usually part of our builder, Bob. Yeah, there's there's a possibility. Make it so. Uh, I'll think about that one. That's uh, okay. I don't know which notebook is it. Which browser is it going to start up on? Yeah, oh, good. Starting Chrome. Chrome seems to be a little lighter weight than most of the other ones. Okay, so this is what we've got right now. So you see it's waiting. This is the, and this is the business you asked me about polling it. It literally does just sit there and wait to see if the applet is fully loaded before it does anything. So what we've done, or what I've done so far at people's requests is in addition to, this is sort of what you saw before, and now we've just added some advanced controls. So you still have the get static image to save, which just gives you a window with a picture in it. You know, I added the I added the spin on click box, but we could add other things too. Um, you can change the size <coughs> from a pop up to some predefined selections as well. You can open it in its own window. And then yeah, this windows you change the size, the applet changes. And it will contain whatever changes you've made. So I haven't shown you yet, but you can change the colors and so on. And if you then pop this up, the new pop-up window will have different colors in it. So when you do that, because of memory issues, a lot of these browsers have very limited memory for the Java applet. I've gone to putting to sleep the ones that are in the worksheet when you pop up a new one. So you have to make it interactive again. Yeah. And then toggle the controls. And so, so far what we have is the ability to change colors and mesh of the display. So if you click on it, I've only got one function up here, but you could have multiple ones. I could <coughs> say, oh, I like this sort of red better. Maybe I want it to be partially translucent. And maybe we want a mesh, and maybe we want the mesh to be blue. You don't have those white speckles. That's because 
I have gone to low resolution. And this is something, I actually, let me, let me do this for you. Um, whoops, get my menu here. Let me bring up the console. It's not anti-alias now. If it's in, so if I do set anti-alias, I think it's display. We'll see if I remember right on. That does look nicer. It looks nicer, but if you, if I now get rid of the, if I make this opaque, I think you'll see speckles when I spin it around here. It depends how sharply varied the surface is, whether you see them. Um, well, that's sort of really but we're talking like no, I know what you're talking about, and I, I thought that the major way to reproduce them was with the anti-aliasing on. Oh, there we are. See yeah. down there? Yeah, there, there. yeah, there they are. Yeah. So it's with the anti, and it has to do with the way it averages pixels together. And what you've got here is we've got black to a lighter color, and you start to average them, and it ends up picking out some white to get the cut huh. at the edge. Is that considered a bug or a feature? <laughs> it's sort of a bug, but it's a, it's one that's hard to I think it's going to be hard to deal with when so things are right next to each other. We get slightly less graphics, but yeah. The other thing that the other reason to turn the anti-aliasing off is that it lowers the memory requirements by a factor of four. Whoa. Yes, definitely turn it off. So <laughs> by default it's off. What I think I may do if people want it is we'll put a little in this display section, you put a little button. That sounds click like button, anti alias display on. With a warning, you know, this uses a lot of memory. If you run into problems, turn it off. I think if you put like high quality, the yeah, high quality that, that uses more resources. High quality memory hog. <laughs> Be <right>. careful. <laughs> or something like that. It does have things pretty much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, especially for saving these pictures for inserting control pages. Now, when you save a picture, JML automatically aliases it before it makes the picture. Uh, so if you get a PNG, if you save the static, wait, so if you turn off anti-aliasing, then save the static image, will you see those cycles? Um, Can you no, I think so. Let me just try it. <laughs> Can you say again why you get this from It has to do with the you're, fact that you're you're this, the anti-aliasing is an, is an averaging process. You just oversampling? Like the oversample and do some... But the, uh, the, the average of like red and black well, it's the, And again, it has, to, it has to do with the way the colors are coded, I guess. And I don't, I don't know the details of this. I wonder if it, is it an overflow? Because it only happens when you're actually looking at skimming across lots of pixels at the same time. Yeah. Right? So maybe is it like averaging it, black and black and black and black and black and then overflowing somewhere? Maybe the other thing may be related to the issue of the lighting, right? Because that gives you these grazing angles. So I don't know the details. I'm wondering if it's anti-aliasing each triangle as it draws it rather than taking the entire picture and anti-aliasing at the end. Yeah, I actually believe it is. So that, that'll do it because okay. the first triangles that go on are going to be yeah. anti-aliasing against White background. Right. The blood one comes up but doesn't overwrite the white yeah. pieces. Interesting. If they drew it at four at twice the size, that's why I thought it was Yeah, they, he draws it, it at twice the size. Draw the entire thing at twice the size without analysing and reduce it doing it by analysing, then you won't have this problem. Huh. Yeah. I'll have to check with Bob. I don't I'm not sure how he implements it, but I think I think that that's what he's doing. Is that he's drawing it at twice the size, but maybe he had it aliasing the twice the size and then scaling yeah, it down. Be. I'm not sure. Cool. We fixed the bug in another project. <laughs> uh, let, me, uh, uh, my, let me write this one down because okay. I'm going to forget to talk to him about this. Okay. Power of bringing together people from various communities, right? We yeah, see this right. in math all the time, right? At a conference where you bring in people from lots of different areas. Okay. So that's basically. That's basically what I wanted to show you at this point. You know, it's got and a little bit of a help. Good. And people were asking about how do you learn the commands. There's the scripting documentation. There's the link to the website and the JMAL wiki. So, so let me get this. 
So if we use the so-called signed application, then we could save and add yes. 